and we're good. Make sure all the lockers are closed. Mike Wiedebach here, um, Q&A. So lots of good stuff here. First question is actually a good one. So a lot of like this back tape is on the market today where people basically have sort of kinesio tape or so for better posture. And the question is, does it work? So let's revert the question. What is it supposed to fix? Slouching, right? So we all slouch, computer, whatever, handies, cell phones. And the thought is that if you have a tape which pulls you upright, you're not slouching anymore. So on the surface, that's a good idea. And it is helpful. It's not useless. However, it will not fix the underlying problem. So the problem under this is that in layman's terms, your chest and front delt are simply too tight because you do this. Your upper trapezius are inflamed and too tight and your middle trapezius and your lats, rhomboids, all that stuff is too weak. So to fix the problem on a permanent basis, you need to shift your weight training or start weight training and simply work on your rows, your reverse shrugs, your pull downs. Simply look up the video on upper cross syndrome on YouTube, my video, and you will get the solutions there. So the back tape is not useless because it's a nice ping as to, hey, you're slouching, but it's not gonna make the problem go away because to make the problem go away, you need actively working those muscles to make them stronger so that these muscles can relax. So now you're saying, why can't I just stretch those muscles? Well, you can, but if they have no counterpart, they're gonna get tight again. So like, let's say I had no triceps, right? For instance, like my bicep would be like so all the time, right? But my tricep stretches it out. So if the muscle then sink, the problem is gonna reappear, right? Question number two is a similar subject. Should you use straps? meaning lifting straps. And my answer is absolutely if you're a bodybuilder. So, first of all, there's a size difference. So my forearms will never ever be able, is the sound okay by the way? I, this mic keeps on dropping, yeah? Good, okay. Um, my forearms will never be as big as my back, okay? So now I can have an ego trip and ruin a good workout with a weak grip or I can use straps. So I have no aspirations of like being an arm wrestler or, or, or doing the closing the captain of crush or being a you know power lifter. So like I don't care what my grip is like. I really don't. Okay. So I have what's called Indian club forearms. They have high insertion, very little muscle until here. So I will just not have Phil Heath's forearms. So if I try like the reverse forearm coils, all that sort of stuff, all I get is inflammation in my forearms and in my wrists, right? So yes, I use straps, okay? Uh, for the simple reason that they allow me to train the bigger muscle more effectively. Now, the newer grips like we have at the gym, I should have brought one, come to think of it, the mag grips allow the hand to fall in like so, and thereby it sits nicely in terms of activating the lats properly. Um, but there's just no way that my hand can hold 400 pounds for reps, whereas deadlifting, that sort of thing, I can absolutely do it from the rest of my body. So as a bodybuilder, why would I shortchange the bigger muscle I'm trying to train just for an ego trip, like, oh, you gotta get a bigger grip, a better grip. It's like, I don't care about my grip. I'm not in the contest of gripping or wrestling or that sort of thing, okay? So that's that. Should you do singles or doubles as a bodybuilder? Absolutely not, unless you wish for an injury. So when I see photos of people, mostly at CrossFit or so, doing their single reps, I cringe. Because first of all, pretty much everything but the target muscle rocks, it's all momentum, ligaments, joints, it's painful to watch. And then it's also like, let's say you don't get injured, which I really hope you won't. What have you accomplished? as a bodybuilder. Like you haven't grown a muscle, it, it breaks down muscle, it's very catabolic, it's also hard on the central nervous system. So you fry your central nervous system just for an ego trip. Like think about it. World class weightlifters, 
You know how often they do like singles or doubles at the top of the performance level? Maybe twice a year. Maybe. For the most part, they train in a much broader range, okay? Because singles and doubles are very, very taxing. It's fight or flight, it's like near death. So as a bodybuilder, stay away, okay? Since we're talking about injuries, what should you adjust when you have gotten injured? So when you've gotten injured, how do you adjust your food? So the first thing is, if it's an injury that allows you not to train at all anymore, you gotta cut the carbs, because you're not moving anymore, right? So the carbs should be cut by 50%, not by 100, but they need less, right? Um, fats I would keep up, because a need for healing, needed for healing. Protein can probably also a bit lower, you know? If it's an injury where, let's say, only like one smaller body part or one motion is being affected, you know, so I have one guy who I'm, it's hopefully wrong, that's not a rotator cuff tear, but if it's a small tear and there's certain motions we can't do, but there's a lot of other things we can do, we won't even have to adjust the food whatsoever, okay? So that always remains to be seen. Um, the next question oh, it actually fits in nicely. Progressive overload. Okay, that's a good question. So progressive overload is the science of you starting like with like 15 reps at a certain weight, you add 5% of weight next the next week, and you drop down to let's say eight reps or so, and then you start a new cycle. And so the, the weight goes up, the reps go down, you start new cycles on and so forth. So progressive overload on the surface works really well, okay? But of course, there's a, you know, at some point you run to like your maximum or so, and you're not getting stronger infinitely, okay? So you change the exercises to get new stimulus, you change the rep ranges and so on and so forth, and you create new stimuli. So that could be like a cluster set, like I did in the last video. Um, it could be like a mechanical drop set that sits in the middle and so on and so forth. So that ties in with the next question is that like, should I record my weights? And the answer is yes and no. So <clears throat> recording your weights is a good idea, especially as a beginner, because it creates accountability and you see progress, right? And progress is cool. So like, oh, a week ago, I could only do 50 pounds, I can do 60 pounds and things are really going well. Great, okay? But of course, at some point, like let's say when you have training as long as I have, then your weights are not going up dramatically or at all, right? Now you look at your log pool, you're like, F that, why am I training, okay? So, then I, I, I was thinking about this and then I thought, hmm, so when I was swimming, my dad at some point gave me like these, these log books and they were very basic, you know? So at first what, what I would report would be like how many yards I swam or meters because I'm from the civilized world and how much I slept and what I ate and if I did anything else, okay? So I would, would write like swam this many meters, ate this much, um, slept eight hours, off I go. Okay? And because in the beginning, the more you swim, the better you get by default, right? But at some point, there's a drop-off point because you can't just swim even more. So what I would do is like, I would look into which block or which workout series is the most important one and how did I feel, how fast did I swim? So in weight training, you could structure your workout that you have like one exercise or one block that's important, like your four mechanical drop sets or like a class set of squats or whatever the case may be, and you, you, you dial in on this one if you're a more advanced athlete. So as you mature as an athlete, you have to take like a bit more of a different approach and not look at your progress so linear as to like, do I lift more weight, okay? Because the question is also like, how do I lift the weight? So this constant focus on lifting more weight leads to injuries because people are like, ah, oh, F that, I'm stuck at 315 bench. Uh, hey, Joey, help me out. <coughs> of course, you're pack, right? So, it's more like, how can I do this intelligently to overload my muscle without injuring myself? So like I said, and then when I was swimming, remember this to the present day, there was one particular workout in November 1999 where I swam uh, the 50 10 times, 10 minutes apart, two minutes apart, and I broke national qualifying on each 50. So from there on, I knew if I'm not getting sick, I'm basically invincible because I can swim so fast 10 times, right? So that was like a breakthrough series. So like that's something you kind of want to play with in terms of real recording. Uh, what else do I have here? Back tape. Yeah, so that was a question that I couldn't believe actually came up. So there's some people apparently in this universe that believe that nutrient partitioning matters more than calories in versus calories out. 
So basically they're saying people are overweight because their hormones, it's always the hormones, miraculously cannot handle certain foods and they're gaining weight. But they don't have to cut the calories, they just have to eat different macros or different foods. So what you're saying is that if I overeat 500 calories worth of carbohydrates, I become fat. But if I overeat 500 calories worth of protein, I lose weight. You must be nuts, okay? So macros matter. I talked about this in yesterday's video. Of course, you got to get your macros right. But if you're overeating, no matter what you're overeating, even though if it's like organic beef from happy cows that got a massage every day and drank beer, you will still gain weight. There's no two ways about it, okay? So by the same token, you also, you cannot say, I'm losing weight on Jack Daniels and ice cream because yes, you would be losing weight, but you would, would be very unhealthy. So if you go back to yesterday's video on YouTube, I give you the phone to, to dial in your macros. Once you get your macros, everything will be taken care of. But to think that there's some magic formula as to, oh, just shift your foods around from green to red and you lose weight. I mean, basically what you're saying is like, the universe is wrong. All the billions and billions of people are wrong. I'm right. And you're not, okay? Then since it's the new year, somebody asked, how do I shop for a gym? That's a good question. So, I'm honestly, I believe one thing, and that's proximity matters most, okay? So, the gym where I train, like, I mean, this is my gym, this is the locker room, but my gym is in the city, and on the weekends, you know, having family, I don't come into the city to train because there's an extra half an hour one way, and so I train at the gym that's close by, and it's, it honestly is not my favorite, but it's just four blocks, right? So, if I, you know, if I was, you know, not having family or so, then it might, maybe I would venture out more, but I'm, I'm just not, okay? So the proximity matters. The best gym is the one you go to. Um, cleanliness matters a great deal to me. Equipment, I mean, I don't know, like, I still, I still haven't used everything in my gym and I've been there for years. There's really, like, a couple of things I need and then other stuff is, like, nice, but it's not that critical. Um, atmosphere... I think, and not to sound judgmental, but I think that matters more for girls than guys because I can totally see how like the gym floor can be intimidating for girls, people like ugly, whatever. Like as a guy, you don't really care about that, but I can see how that could be uncomfortable, you know? So that's something I'm probably not qualified to make a statement about. Um, but cleanliness, our machines being repaired often enough, you know, and then pricing that actually comes last in my opinion because my buddy got a great deal in a in a gold's gym in Brooklyn and he paid for the full year and went twice. So each rocket was like three hundred dollars, so that was a good deal. So I would say proximity, cleanliness, equipment and then maybe atmosphere, something like that. Um deload weeks. So that goes with, with progressive overload. So like every couple of weeks you should take like a couple of days or so where basically you take your entire workout and you chop everything in half, weights, reps, sets, and it basically becomes a warm-up. So like 20 minutes. So it, it would fit in nicely. Let's say you have a business trip and you can't go to the gym as is because you're traveling and there's a hotel gym. So you just take your existing workout, chop everything in half and make that your deload, for instance, okay? That's done for like over recovery, mental freshness and what have you. And what else do I have? Is there a perfect time to train? I mean, most people are better in the afternoon, but the best time to train is when you go. So you can get adjust to it. Like I train in the morning just because I kind of enjoy the quiet times and you know not being pinged or whatever. But uh, if you're for taste to go Monday afternoon, then that's fine. There's no perfect time to train. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about that. The same goes for eating around the workers of the people, like yours truly. Um, working out at like 5, 5.30 and not getting up at 3 to eat breakfast. I'm just not, okay? So I'll uh, I have like sort of like like a shake with some gummy bears as I go there and then I eat afterwards. So unless you train twice a day, this whole eating around the workout is not that important, okay? So within three hours before and after you should eat, but it doesn't have to be like 20 minutes like right there after, okay? That's really not that critical. So that's that. Anybody else has a question, by all means type it in. Let's kind of go through the list here, seeing what we have. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Strength loss when dieting. So, 
somebody goes on a cut, right? And you will be losing strength. And the question is always like, when do you pull the plug and when do you say this is too much, right? So on my first cut, I was like way too aggressive and my strength dropped literally by 50%. Like I went from like a 380 bench to like 200, right? So that was obviously too much. So generally speaking, a 10% strength loss in non-drug assisted athlete is totally acceptable and fine, right? So then of course it becomes a question of how much time do you have and what's your goal? So if you're in a rush to get super lean because you, like, you started late, then you will have to accept more muscle loss. If you have time, you can keep on more muscle. So if your strength drops 20% or more, I would recommend take a step back. Um, I would add some more carbs to the diet and maybe take an extra day off and see if I come back. And if I'm not, then I would um, you know, add even more carbs to it and rather diet another extra two weeks than lose more muscle. Do I recommend stretching during sets? Absolutely not. So we talked about stretching. Um, so there's three kinds. There's, um, there is ballistic, which is like this whipping stuff, which is should nobody do ever. Um, then there is static, which is people just holding something like that and they stretch. And then there's dynamic, which is like a pack fly, let's say, right? So static stretching um, actually weakens you. So you always see this, um, you know, being Monday, like there's some dudes in the gym, they're like, oh, stretch my pecs. And then they start benching. You're asking for an injury, okay? So after your workout, you can stretch all you want. It has, may or may not have some effect on recovery, but never, never do the sets. It's, it's, it's just a dangerous practice, okay? So no, no stretching. So the sets I believe, oh, you know, this one recovered. I really gotta work on my own handwriting. If you can't read your, read your own notes, how often should you change your plan? Uh, that, that, yeah, we kind of covered that. So like every four to five weeks is good to change your plan. Um, but you also shouldn't change just because to change, right? So there are a lot of stories out there that say like uh, Jay Cutler says like, oh, I trained the same program for all my pro career. Like, okay, first of all, who knows? Secondly, he trains in different gyms at different machines at different angles. And certainly you're not Jay Cutler. So out of boredom, I would suggest to change the program every four to five weeks. I can help you with that if you want to reach out. But what you, um, so boredom begets injury and kills progress, right? So you never want to be like knowing what you're doing already. So I remember when I was swimming, they would make us swim the same thing for three months straight. So every, every Monday was the same. And trust me, you just want to shoot yourself, you know? So four to five weeks, um, if something works, you know, you can just do a modification of the program where you, you just swap out, let's say like, bend over rows for cable rows, something like that, so you don't need to switch the whole program, but you just make some modifications. Um, but you know, that, that has been a, hey, Lucy, we did the, uh, the, did the macros um, in, a, in an earlier question, so you can just like, when it's all done, you can just rewind and, and watch the, the clip for that, okay? So that's all I have today before, so my brother's in town, going for a steak dinner, I think I'm getting the porterhouse for two, even though people always say that's for two people. And last time I told the reader, that's what you say. So anyways, thanks for chiming in. And uh, I shall see you next week, okay? Thanks, guys.